Aung San Suu Kyi will not be Myanmar's next president. She's nominated a close aide and confidant instead. But as Myanmar transitions to democracy, will Suu Kyi effectively lead from behind the scenes? And how will she and her party compromise with the military? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. After her party won a landslide victory in parliamentary elections last year, Nobel Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi was well placed to lead Myanmar. But her two sons are British, and under the country's military drafted constitution, that prevents her from becoming president. Having failed to convince the army to let her run anyway, she's named Tin Chao, a man from her inner circle, as nominee widely seen as a way for Sun Chi to rule Myanmar indirectly. Lots for us to discuss, but first Al Jazeera's Wayne Hay has this report from Napidor. This was another important step in Myanmar's transition to democracy. Members of parliament gathered in the capital Napidor to hear nominations for the next president. I'm happy because the hope for our country starts here. Hope for Myanmar citizens starts from today too. That's why I'm excited. But there was no sign of the woman who's campaigned for this moment for decades. Aung San Suu Kyi led her National League for Democracy party to a big win in November's election. But under the military drafted constitution, she's barred from becoming president. Negotiations to change the rules failed amid signs the political transition is not going smoothly. But the next president will come from the NLD because it dominates both houses of parliament. The favourite is the lower house's nominee Tin Chor, a low-profile 69-year-old who's a trusted, loyal ally of the party leader. The NLD hasn't given up hope of Aung San Suu Kyi becoming president. In fact, it's believed there'll be another push for constitutional amendment within the next year. But to achieve that, relations with the military will need to improve significantly. And whoever is elected by members of parliament next week will have to be someone who's happy to stand aside and allow Suu Kyi to take over. I think she will be president. After the amendment of the constitution, 2008 constitution. We have to try to amend this constitution with full force. The military will also nominate a presidential candidate and the two unsuccessful nominees after the vote will become vice presidents. Wayne Hay, Al Jazeera, Napidor. After half a century of military rule and ethnic conflict, Myanmar's path towards democracy has been a long one. It started with a new constitution published in 2008 that allowed for a multi-party system, but also reserved significant powers for the military. And even with this step towards democracy, opposition leader Su Chi was kept under house arrest until November 2010. Military rule officially ended that year, but the main military-backed party, the USDP, still held government. An opposition group said that the election kept them in power was fraudulent. President Tin Sein was inaugurated in March 2011. He's implemented some reforms over his tenure, including allowing peaceful demonstrations and supposedly investigating violence against Rohingya Muslims. And Suu Kyi's party won 80% of parliamentary seats in a huge victory in November, but the army is still very powerful. And it's been unreceptive to talks about changing the constitution to allow Suu Kyi to run for president. Well, let's now bring in our guests. Joining us from Bangkok is Sam Zarifi. He's the regional director at Asia and the Pacific International Commission of Jurists. In Napidor on Skype, we have Cho Zua Mo, editor of the English edition Irrawaddy magazine, and also a former political prisoner who was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in student-led protests. And in London, Wang Zani, Burmese democracy advocate, human rights campaigner, and a research fellow at the London School of Economics. Welcome to you all. 
Let's bring in uh, in Naipido with Cho Zwa Mo. The opposition leader has said that she will be at the top. She's made very clear uh, that she wants to be in control. Will the president be a mere proxy, do you believe? Well, I, I think, uh, yes, even though she cannot be the president of Myanmar at the moment, uh, she will be in charge of uh, everything. Uh, I mean, the parliament and the government and all of the uh, uh, cabinet members. Uh, so I think she will be able to uh, control uh, the government uh, as well as the parliament. Now, I think the in the uh, upcoming administration, uh, she will appoint a president and she likes, she trusts. Uh, Tenjo will be the Tenjo will be the uh, one of you know uh, uh, trusted persons uh, in in uh, in the uh, inner cycle of the NLD. So I think she will she will directly uh, control the government, even though she cannot be the president. But I think there is a big challenge uh, how to deal with the military uh, in coming months and in coming years. Well, that's the point we're going to get to. But Sam Zarifi in Bangkok, uh, this issue of whether or not Suu Kyi will be in control. Now, the military has written a constitution to keep her out of the control. Uh, what are they going to be saying about her guiding things behind the scenes? Well, the military has been very clear that it still actually controls uh, uh, essentially the country. They've just given up a bit of the administration over to the NLD. But remember that the military itself, of course, is the largest and most, one of the most powerful institutions in the country. It controls the home ministry. It controls the general administration of the country, so the actual bureaucracy that runs uh, cities and villages. So the military uh, is still clearly the most powerful institution in the country, and they've shown that they're not really in the mood to take uh, instructions from uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. They've compromised a bit, but on, on the very mo important issues around their own control over the country, they have shown themselves absolutely uncompromising. Well, Wang Sa Ni, you have put it, uh, perhaps rather unkindly, as the lady against the beasts, that what is being set up here down the road is a deep competition between Suu Kyi and the military. Well, I think, you know, the headlines have been uh, uh, rather misleading in the sense that, uh, you know, the issue of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, whether uh, she will become president acceptable to the military or she will not as constitutionally barred uh, by the military's constitution. Um, you know, that is not the issue uh, facing um, the, you know, uh, the, the country and, the, um, you know, serving as the obstacle to democratization. The issue, as Sam uh, rightly uh, pointed out, the military remains uncompromising in terms of its prerogatives uh, to rule the country as it deems fit. Uh, you know, the, the, beneath the facade of uh, democratization, uh, moves and rhetoric and trappings of, um, you know, Western uh, pol uh, parliamentary democracy uh, systems, institutions such as parliament or the uh, tr nominal uh, transfer of power that will come on the 31st of March. The military controls uh, the entire country geographically, militarily, in terms of uh, human security, movements of people, and most importantly, the military is uh, in charge of the lion's share of the Burma's economy. So in terms of politics, power, and economy, as well as populations and, and, and territories, the military is, uh, will remain uh, the ultimate decider, not Aung San Suu Kyi, whether as president or as somebody who rules a country above the president. Well, oh, Chozwa Mo, I just want to pick up on that particular issue. Let's be very specific. The military holds 25% of seats in both houses unelected. The constitution can only be changed with a poll greater than 75%. Therefore, while the military is in place in the parliaments, uh, there can be no changes whatsoever. We heard uh, Mung um, Zani there referring to the trappings of democracy, this uh, image of a Western-type parliament. But while the military sits there with 
in the end, a very, very great power, there is no real democratic parliament in existence at all, is there? Well, of course, you know, uh, as long as this uh, a democratic constitution uh, exists uh, in our country, uh, we cannot really see the, uh, the, the, the genuine democracy uh, being implemented in, in the society. But at the same time, this is at the beginning of the new era. Uh, uh, if we look back the history since 1962, uh, the new uh, the new administration, the Atkami administration, will be the, uh, Burma's first uh, the real civilian government led by the uh, the uh, the civilian president. Uh, so I think this is a new era. Uh, but I think for uncertainty and hard administration. Uh, the military is one of the biggest uh, uh, obstacles uh, uh, on road ahead uh, for example, how to deal with the uh, uh, military in terms of uh, uh, amending the constitutions, including the 59F and the 25% uh, uh, of the military appointees in the constitution, again, the uh, peace process. So it is really important how to deal with the uh, military for the NAD administration. But I think I think this is a new era for the Burmese people. Uh, so I think the uh, the most uh, and the biggest challenge for the entity is uh, they should come up with a, a, a policy and in which they can uh, really work with the military uh, leadership and in which uh, the military leadership should be uh, uh, comfortable as well. It doesn't mean that uh, the NAD government uh, should uh, be, uh, give a, a lot of uh, opportunities or political uh, opportunities to the military. But I think they have to negotiate with the, the military leaders uh, in the coming years. Well, Sam Zarifi, um, there has been this particular criticism, but as uh, Cho Zouamo was uh, saying there, though, there has been change. For the first time, you will have a leader who is not either in uniform or a military <clears throat> man in civilian clothes. There is significance in mm -hmm. this, is there not? Look, there's no doubt that there have been uh, real improvements in, in Myanmar. Uh, we're starting from a very low baseline, it's true. This was a very repressive country. And we have seen in the past uh, two, three, four years uh, real incredible advances in terms of opening up of uh, civil society, a flowering of expression of association. However, the military has shown itself also able to arrest uh, students, to arrest critics. But there's no doubt that there have been real improvements. I think there's no doubt that overall uh, the trends in the country are positive. There are huge issues around the ethnic conflicts and in particular the treatment of the Rohingya. But uh, the trends are positive and at this point we're really looking for improvements and not perfection. We're not looking for full parliamentary democracy right now. It's not really possible but this is clearly a, a big milestone uh, in the country to have a civilian uh, elected to the office of the president from a party that is holding a very clear and very powerful electoral mandate. That's a big step forward for Myanmar and frankly for the region. Well, I'm going to return to the issue of minorities in a moment, but Wong um, I want to just stay with the army for a moment. Now, critics have insisted that the army is playing a strategy in order to encourage Western investment. The critics say, as one writer has put it, that they beckon the West with one hand and throttle dissent with another. They are intent on bringing in foreign investment into Myanmar, are they not? Yes, um, uh, you know, uh, I disagree very strongly with uh, t two of my co-panelists on, on the issue of progress, you know. I, I think the, uh, the, I can say uh, with uh, confidence, having worked with, you know, essentially three heads of military intelligence pushing for opening up of the country, over, uh, you know, uh, the, when, when no Burmese would touch the generals with a long pole. And they have absolutely no interest uh, in working with Aung San Suu Kyi. And when she came to London in 2012, I actually informed her in, in a brief writing that, that she, the military will not tangle with her and she must not 
get her hopes up. And obviously, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, NLD's politics is driven by hope rather than uh, realistic and strategic calculations. In terms of foreign investment uh, and the opening up as a strategic, uh, uh, you know, uh, the platform to invite the foreign investment in, to make the military acceptable internationally, uh, to use Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and her limited, um, you know, role in Burmese politics as, as a bait as you will, um, you know, uh, the, with the international community that is, in, uh, you know, very much uh, in, in adm admiration of Aung San Suu Kyi. Yes, you are right. I think the, um, the main goal of the military here is essentially to set up a two-tier political system where they do the ultimate backseat driving, uh, uh, you know, uh, be, um, when the Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD government uh, are, you know, uh, sitting in the driver's seat. And uh, I, I, there is no clause in the Constitution that says that after certain uh, election cycles, the military will, you know, reduce its, uh, you know, prerogatives and, and curtail its role and control in politics. And so I think the military intends to stay uh, you know, according to this constitution, and even if they have to declare state of emergency and come back in and stage another military coup, which is at this point not likely, but in the future no one knows, uh, the military has, uh, you know, legalized any future possibility of staging a coup imposing the military rule over the uh, country again. And so I think I, I am not actually um, uh, that optimistic. And this is a new era, yes. But the new era of, uh, you know, uh, investment, privatization, uh, the expansion, uh, you know, the, the growing gap between the super rich that are affiliated with the military and the military families and the deepening and widening uh, uh, poverty across the country. And then and, and, uh, finally, how can you say that this is like, you know, uh, a, a major leap forward when the country and the regime are accused of uh, committing, the, uh, you know, at the very least, crimes against humanity and, uh, at worst, the genocide uh, against the, the Rohingyas. And civil war is still raging on, not uh, fading away despite the peace process. So these are things that we need to factor in and uh, empirically when we discuss Burma. Well, Cheswa Mo, what's your response to that rather bleak prognosis? Well, I, I, we cannot refuse that you know the country has uh, progressed a lot over the over the past years, even though the the, the so-called civilian regime led by Putin say uh, ruled the country. And at the moment, I think the uh, we 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 have seen that the military uh, was forced or ha has to recognize the result of the election. Uh, in which uh, the, the National League for Democracy won by landslide, and then they had to promise that they, uh, they will work with the, uh, the new administration. So now, now this is uh, another process. Uh, they will hand over the power to the civilian-led government uh, at the end of the March. So I think, the, uh, as I said earlier, this is at the beginning of the new era. And then the, we will see the, uh, the diverse and uh, inclusive uh, administration uh, led by Aung San Suu Kyi and her, pre her president. So I, I think the, uh, the military, for the military, they cannot really grip the power as strongly as ever uh, over the past 50 years. I think they have to uh, they know that uh, where they are standing and where the country is heading. And the, so I think they really have to work together with the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's administration to some extent. Of course, you know, they will, they will not be very willing uh, to help or to work with the new administration. That's why I think their main duty is uh, to safeguard the constitution, uh, which guarantees the military uh, to have a certain power uh, in the parliament and in the government so I think the next five years, they were trying to safeguard the uh, Constitution. Um, but the Aung San Suu Kyi's administration, if they can uh, make them comfortable in the new political order, 
definitely I think the new generation of the military uh, uh, will not be very reluctant to work with the uh, new administration. But, but we cannot really get rid of the role of the military uh, next five or ten years. But they will, re they will reduce uh, their power uh, uh, gradually, probably. Well, well, uh, Mung Zani, while, while everybody's getting comfortable with each other over the next five years, I want to return to that point that you brought up, the issue of the minorities, in particular the Rohingya. What is going to happen to them during this political uh, almost turmoil which we will be seeing with not one but two backseat drivers in effect? Well, I mean, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi's um, incoming government uh, including the parliamentarians from the National League for Democracy, um, <clears throat> has absolutely no Muslim representative. In other words, we have, um, you know, say five million Muslims, including the Rohingyas, uh, in the entire country, and not a single Muslim politician was allowed to run in the uh, election. And uh, that is actually uh, by order of no one other than Aung San Suu Kyi herself. She had cleansed her party of, um, the, you know, Muslim uh, politicians and representatives. And, of course, as to the, uh, the military as a national institution, you will not find a single Muslim officer above the, um, the rank of captain or even a uh, uh, captain, essentially. So we have two national institutions, the National League for Democracy, uh, led by Aung San Suu Kyi and very popular uh, you know, in, in the country. And we have the most powerful national organization called the Armed Forces, the Army. And both institutions have cleansed themselves of any Muslim representatives. Uh, you know, for the army, it was, it has been pursued as a matter of policy to purge uh, Muslims uh, as well as uh, Christians of any strategic position. So, my, the as far as the plight of Muslim minorities, particularly the Rohingyas. Uh, who have been subject to national policy of persecution over the last 40 years, uh, they cannot really uh, hope to get their lives improved, their persecution ended. Well, Either if, if under I may in interrupt you there, Mung Zani, yeah. uh, apologies, but I want to get to Zam Zarifi on this particular issue of the minorities and what is going to happen to them in this process of transition. Well, uh, let's, uh, we have to separate out to some extent the Rohingya and maybe the, the Muslim minority uh, to, to a bit. The issue of the conflict with the, ethnic, the other ethnic minorities have, has, of course, been going on for quite some time. And there is a major effort to try to reach a ceasefire and some kind of accommodation with them. Some of these efforts have been successful, but we still see very serious conflicts that are going on, uh, resulting in serious uh, injuries to civilians and displacement. The hope of the government, uh, I think we're going to see from the NLD side, to try to create a government of national reconciliation. If they can do that politically, that's a challenge. And whether they can control the uh, military, which still has a very poor record, and seems to be continuing that poor record in terms of how it conducts the conflicts, uh, that's a major challenge for, uh, for, for the people of Myanmar. The issue of the Rohingya and the Muslims is, is different because their treatment seems to be, uh, in fact, getting worse in this environment, and anti-Muslim feelings have become a political tool for the military and some of the extremist Buddhist groups that are associated uh, with the right wing that are using this. For the Rohingya themselves, I think what's clear is that there is a bit of a sense of wait and see from them. They are hopeful that the NLD will do something for them, although the NLD hasn't really promised anything to them. Well, on that question, we're going to have to finish. Thanks to all our guests, Sam Zarifi, Cho Zwa Mo, and Wang Zani. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Insight Story. 
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.